This week on ANN, remembering the life and legacy of Nelson Mandela. The first Adventist college established outside of North America celebrates a milestone. And changing lives one gift at a time. These stories and more coming up. This is ANN, a service of the Seventh day Adventist World Church. Thank you so much for joining us this week. First in the news, Adventist World Church President Ted Wilson last week joined other faith leaders in recognizing the life and legacy of Nelson Mandela, South Africa's first black president. Mandela was the champion of the country's struggle for racial equality. He died on December 5th at age 95. Wilson said Mandela's life of forgiveness and reconciliation served as a light in a world that too often lives in the shadow of reprisal, anger, and malice. He also expressed condolences to the Mandela family and to the citizens of South Africa. Tens of thousands of South Africans and dozens of world leaders this week paid tribute to Mandela during a memorial service in Johannesburg. The Adventist Church in Switzerland this week released a video promoting religious freedom. The video highlights three of the world's major religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, and illustrates how discrimination can destroy lives. The video was released in coincidence with the International Human Rights Day on December 10. Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights defends freedom of thought, conscious, and religion. The Seventh-day Adventist Church strongly supports human rights because at its core, religious freedom is a fundamental human right. We don't actually get to pick and choose which right is important. It's important to stand for all of them. Because as a religious minority group ourselves, who will stand for us if we can't support the rights for people everywhere to follow freedom of conscience and their beliefs? The first Adventist college established outside of North America is celebrating 120 years of education. Helderberg College near Cape Town, South Africa was established to prepare young people for service to God and the community. The school's history goes back to 1893 when Claremont College was established. The school that would one day become Helderberg College moved two more times before settling on the slopes of Helderberg Mountain just outside Somerset West. Today, Helderberg College offers degrees in theology, business, communication, and psychology. The college draws on an international student body, enrolling students from dozens of countries each semester. What an important mission Helderberg College has carried forward for more than a century, educating young people in various fields to competently serve in the community, the church, and the world field as they look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. If a cow isn't on your Christmas shopping list, it might be time to flip through this year's really useful gift catalog from the Adventist Development and Relief Agency. The high impact gifts are an opportunity for holiday shoppers to change lives this Christmas. A gift of beehives can provide sustainable income for a family in a developing nation. Owning a cow can mean a better life for impoverished people in Bangladesh. Other gifts help fund education, income generation, and disaster relief. Gift number 14 helps support a safe house program in Romania that rescues victims of domestic violence. ADRA's gift catalog is your opportunity to give a gift this year that's not just a trinket, but that will make an impact in the life of somebody in need. You can find this year's really useful gift catalog at giftcatalog.adra.org. An adjunct film and television professor at Adventist-owned La Sierra University is gaining recognition for his film about a real-life miracle. Christoph Silber tells the story of a young doctor who risked his professional reputation to save a drowned girl in a day for a miracle. The film won an international Emmy in the TV movie miniseries category. It aired in Austria and Germany earlier this year to a record audience. Silber was a presenter at last year's Sunscreen Film Festival in the U.S. state of California. He's best known internationally for co-writing Goodbye Lenin, a 2003 film about a young man from East Berlin who protects his mother from the shock of German reunification when she awakes from a coma. More than 6,000 shoeboxes packed with school supplies, clothing, small toys, and hygiene kits are on their way to orphans and other disadvantaged children in the West African country of Sierra Leone. The kids are this year's recipients of the Adventist Development and Relief Agency's Christmas Shoebox Appeal in the United Kingdom. Last year, gift boxes helped support AIDS orphans in Burkina Faso. 
ADRA officials in the UK say the project brings joy to children living in poverty during the holiday season. Adventist owned Loma Linda University Medical Center in the U.S. state of California is pioneering a new procedure for end stage macular degeneration. The surgery involves implanting a miniature telescope into a patient's eye. The telescope restores vision by magnifying images and projecting them onto the part of the retina not affected by the disease. Loma Linda University Medical Center is the first hospital in the region to offer the implant. Macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in older Americans. And finally in the news this week, Jimsy Tisma of Haiti is the winner of the 10th annual Inter-American Bible Boom held at La Vibora Adventist Church in Havana, Cuba. The final round of the region-wide Bible competition covered the books of Ephesians through Hebrews. All 20 finalists traveled to Cuba to take part in the event. Coming up, the holistic ministry of global mission pioneers. Why do humans fear great white sharks and see them as the mindless killers of the deep? Why do many people all over the world fear to enter the waters of any ocean? Join our three adventurers as they encounter these apex predators of the ocean. Um, they are predators, so yes, they do hunt, but they aren't these mindless killing machines made out by the media. Coming to the Hope Channel in January 2014. During communism, corporal punishment, it was just the thing to do. That meant I have to put my hands out. And I would get so many hits on my hands that instead of having the dip, it was puffing out. I would pray that God would keep me safe. My name is Adrian, and my prayer was answered. I love to surf. I started surfing when I was a teenager. One day, I was out surfing. It was a holiday, it was the 4th of July, and the beaches were very overcrowded. The lifeguards had their work cut out for them. About halfway through the day, the lifeguards decided to put out the yellow flag with the black spot right in the center of it, which tells people, no more surfing. The waves were extremely large that day, and so I came in and brought my board to the beach. I didn't want to stop surfing, even though we weren't allowed to surf anymore, so I went out and decided to body surf in these large waves. They were way overhead, as we would call it. So I went out anyways and started body surfing. Unfortunately for me, the waves were overpowering me and kept pounding me down into the surf, down under the water. And I began to start drowning. Suddenly, I felt a hand grab my arm as I was underneath the water and pull me up. It was a lifeguard. He had come to rescue me. He told me to grab onto the flotation device that he had brought with him, and he brought me into shore. I was rescued and he saved my life. Did you know that you and I can be rescued from the power of sin over our life? That Jesus, just like that lifeguard, came to rescue us and to save us from our sin. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be saved through the life of Jesus Christ. Freedom was actually God's idea. When we discover that our greatest freedom is surrendering to Him and permitting Him to direct our steps, then we experience true freedom. Welcome back. Global Mission Pioneers volunteer to establish congregations in places within their culture where there isn't an Adventist presence. They already know the language and can often impact the community more effectively than an overseas missionary. A new DVD from Adventist Mission shares their stories. I love hearing stories about Global Mission Pioneers and the work they do. These men and women don't have it easy because they leave their hometowns to move to an area where there is no Seventh-day Adventist presence. Their sole purpose is to start a new group of believers, so you can imagine some of the challenges they face. Sometimes their work is dangerous and difficult, but they have learned that when they obey God's call, triumph will surely follow. 
If you would like to meet some interesting church planters, we have some good stories for you on a brand new DVD. You'll see a little girl in Brazil that conducts her own Bible study groups along the Amazon River. And you'll learn how a pioneer in Myanmar conducts a motorbike ministry. And of course, you'll want to hear all about the longhouse in Malaysia and what's happening in the outback of Australia. These are just a few of the stories and countries represented on the Global Mission Pioneer DVD. You can watch the short stories separately, or you can select the Play All option and enjoy them all at once. To get your own free DVD, visit AdventistMission.org and ask for the Global Mission Pioneer DVD. Thank you for your prayers and financial support of Global Mission. In churches geared for those who can hear, deaf children often struggle to make sense of Christianity. Larry Evans explains on this month's feature from Deaf Ministries. No way, just forget it. Such were the words of a very bright but defiant 16-year-old. Not unusual, you say, for a 16-year-old? But before we write these words off as teenage rebellious talk, let me explain a little more. This 16-year-old has been deaf from early childhood. His negative reaction was in response to a comment someone made that God can understand sign language. The teenager went on to say, he is a God for the hearing. He can't understand my language. <clears throat> like most deaf people, he was the only deaf person in his family. And although his parents dragged him to the church for his entire life, he made little or no sense out of the gospel. Despite assurances that God loves and understands him, Christianity made no sense at all. Everything he knew about church was only for those who could hear. No wonder that today only 2-4% to 4 of the culturally deaf are Christian. Many of them are children. On your screen you will see faces of deaf children that I've met when visiting the various parts of the world. They are among the fortunate ones, for they have a Christian parent who understands their sign language. Some have a pastor who spends time with them even if he can't understand their sign language. But millions of children have no way to learn about Jesus. That makes me ask the question, are we listening to them? Do our actions and our priorities show the deaf world that we care? Please, we must not leave any deaf child behind. What began as a prayer hotline during the 10 Days of Prayer initiative is now a regular outlet for sharing blessings and prayer requests. Rick Rimmers explains. I'm thankful for the opportunity to work with prayer ministries among a number of congregations. And at the beginning of the year, we wanted to participate in the 10 Days of Prayer, but we were looking for, for a way to bring people together from uh, a, a broad territory. And so we came up with a telephone conference call prayer line. And so each morning during the 10 days of prayer in January, we had a facilitator lead out, but people were calling in from multiple states in order to share their prayer requests and commit themselves to the Lord. It was a wonderful way for people to get acquainted with other needs beyond their own, to be able to share their needs and, and have others lift them up before the Lord. And we used some of the, the wonderful materials that are at the 10 daysofprayerorg in order to, to help provide scripture passages that could feed our prayer time. There were individuals who were rather shy and when they started they weren't very comfortable sharing but on the telephone they could be quiet and listen to others if they wanted to others came and and with tears and great passion they were sharing their burden for for others and we could lift them up in prayer it became such a powerful impact that we've continued on week by week throughout the year and been blessed to have this prayer time together Advent Source offers books, videos, seminars, and how-to guides to support lay ministry. We asked Jonathan Kunteroff to share some of the resources available for local personal ministry leaders. Some of you have been elected to serve as personal ministry leaders in your local church. What are you going to do? I have some good news for you. And one of them is that we have prepared special leaflets for personal ministry leaders. 
and this leaflet has many other small leaflets. Let me share with you. Personal ministry leaders, what are you going to do? How can you inspire and motivate and train and equip people to do witness activities? Some of you would like to train people how to give Bible studies. We have some materials. How can we give Bible studies to people so they will be able to introduce Jesus and bring people to accept Jesus? Well, sometimes we like to go from door to door, but we do not know how can we do that. We have also materials to train people to go from door to door. And uh, it is important as what the Bible says about the important role of small group ministries. And we have also materials for small group ministries, small group ministries for Bible studies, for nurture, so that we can support one another and we can prepare more people for the kingdom of God. And sometimes, after giving Bible studies, we do not know how to bring people to make the decision. I like to share with you these special materials, how to bring people to make decisions. All of these materials you can find through Advent Source. And by being equipped, you will be more ready to do witnessing activities. Thus, be involved for the glory of God. Still ahead, advice for parents of grown children. But up next, our science correspondent says Jesus' birth in a stable illustrates how babies are born to thrive in a fallen world. If the elephant had a particularly close relationship with its deceased peer, it can show signs of depression. Even years later, elephants have been observed revisiting the site where one of their herd or family died. They will often remain here for days at a time, mourning the loss of that one. How do you feel about your mum or your grandmother? How would you feel if you lost a child? Elephants have exactly the same emotions. Coming to the Hope Channel in January 2014. When Jesus walked the earth, he knew his disciples would change the world through the power he gave to them and to us. That movement needed organization, and it still does today, which is why God gave us the church, the object of his supreme regard. The church is far more than just buildings and places where we can gather, worship, teach, and serve others. The church is made up of people people who have accepted Jesus and want to follow Him in their lives. People who believe in their God-given mission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. God's church reaches all around the globe, offering fellowship, strength and hope in Jesus. Accept God's gift of His church today. As I was reading through the great hope, these words caught my attention. The framers of the Constitution of the United States recognized the eternal principle that man's relation with God is above human legislation. The Bible was held by the Pilgrim Fathers as the foundation of faith. Here's why this vision brings hope to me. I have seen the fruits of this faith and this vision in the lives of my grandparents who sacrificed their lives in Soviet Russia to protect the freedom to choose how to worship, to defend the oppressed, to defend the minorities. It gave meaning to their lives. Welcome back. 
The latest science indicates that babies are born with a hypervigilant immune system, helping them thrive in imperfect conditions. Tim Standish reports. The fact that Jesus was placed in a manger immediately after birth may seem surprising to modern mothers who go out of their way to keep their babies safe from germs. At least among my family and friends, the smell of a newborn baby's home includes the freshly scrubbed scent of disinfectant and baby powder with only a hint of exhausted mother and used diapers. All the cleaning that goes on around the time a baby's born may be instinctive, but it serves a purpose. Babies are born with immune systems that leave them vulnerable to some infections. And yet we all know that babies can't be kept in a completely sterile environment. By the time we're adults, we're populated by a diverse microbiome that scientists only partially understand at this point. The flora of our gut, made up of many different bacteria and other organisms, appears to play an important role in keeping us healthy. How does that flora get into our bodies? It used to be thought that babies were born with immature immune systems that made them vulnerable to infections. But a different view is now emerging. It turns out that babies have immune systems that are capable of a formidable immune response, but dial it back around the time of birth so that they don't immediately have an allergic reaction to everything they encounter outside the womb. This is especially true of their gut, where they allow bacteria to colonize without a massive reaction that would both compromise the ability of beneficial bacteria to work with them and possibly kill the baby. A manger would probably not be the first choice of most mothers. But Jesus was born just as babies are today, with the ability to thrive and grow in a fallen world under imperfect conditions. He was very much the human son of Mary and the son of God. Possibly more amazing than his humanity was his power to save all of us so that we can join with John and exclaim, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. The updated mobile app from ANN supports the newly redesigned Adventist.org. Andrew King has a preview in this week's Tech Corner. If you really enjoy staying up to date with the Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world by watching this program, what do you do if you can't watch it every week on the Hope Channel? One option is to watch it online. Simply Google Adventist News Network. There you can watch every episode we have ever produced, and you can easily share a segment you find particularly interesting with your friends on your Facebook page. But there's also a second option. If you have a smartphone, you can install the Adventist News Network app on your phone. The app is available on Apple iPhones and iPads, as well as Android devices. Just go to the App Store and search for Adventist News Network. Once you have the app installed, it gives you three main options at the bottom of the screen. You can either view text news, videos like the one you're watching right now, or a photo gallery. The photo gallery shows great images and captions of Seventh-day Adventist events from around the world. The video section allows you to watch the full ANN video episode each week on your mobile device. And the news section allows you to see the most recent news story that Adventist News Network has published. We hope you find this app useful for staying connected with your worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church family. Parents whose children have grown up and moved out sometimes find adjusting to life as a couple again difficult, but as Willie and Elaine Oliver say, it's the ideal opportunity to rekindle a marriage. That's a couple to do, you know, after their children are gone and they find themselves in the emptiness syndrome. Mm, emptiness, that would be us. Our children are sort of gone and gone. Um, they are gone. Indeed. You say it with such finality. No, they're gone. Yeah, okay, they're kind of on their own, right? But anyway, what's, what are couples, what's a couple supposed to do? Um, basically, couples really should practice spending time together before their kids leave. But for those couples who haven't done so, this is a perfect opportunity to reacquaint yourself with your spouse. And it really is 
as simple as starting out as if you just met. Because what often happens is that people wake up the day after their children are gone and they look across the table or the bed or wherever and then they say, Who is this person? Who is this person that's, that's across true. from me? Yeah. And so this is really a great opportunity not to panic, but to take the opportunity to reacquaint yourself with your spouse. I think that a good thing to do is to go back to square one. Uh, go back to when you first met and uh, what things you like to do. Why did you stay together? Go back, find that place, connect, and start your romance all over again. Now let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, the first Adventist church building in Sydney, Australia is dedicated. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On December 8, in 2012, Max Torkelson, longtime Adventist administrator, educator, and a former General Vice President of the General Conference, died in Portland, Oregon, aged 86. On December 10, in 1892, the first Seventh-day Adventist church building in Sydney, Australia, was dedicated in Parramatta, one of Sydney's western suburbs, after evangelistic meetings by American missionary A.G. Daniels and a recent convert from New Zealand, Robert Hare. This was the first Adventist church in Australia outside Melbourne. And on December 12 in 1866, the first Seventh-day Adventist church in the United States state of Maine had been organized at Norwich Walk by Merritt E. Cornell, John N. Andrews, and James and Ellen White. The same day, December 12, but 56 years later, in 1922, the Ceylon Mission was formed with missionary H. A. Hansen as superintendent. Today, it is the Sri Lanka Mission, which has around 4,000 church members. And also on December 12, but 72 years earlier, in 1850, Charles H. Jones had been born in Warner, New Hampshire. From 1879 until 1933, he worked for Pacific Press for much of that time as its head. He also made short visits to Britain and Canada and helped to start Adventist publishing work in those countries. Thanks for watching This Week in Adventist History. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. In the meantime, check out the Adventist Church Facebook page at facebook.com slash the Adventist Church. We're posting new versions of the Take the Gift series with Adventist President Ted Wilson all throughout December. These Christmas gifts are a great way to share your faith during the holiday season. Our good news for this week comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. The passage says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding is unfathomable. Amen. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.